I, uh, I thought I'd just spend a, just a few minutes talking about um, some of the work that CSIRO is, is doing in this area of demand side technologies and, and why, what are the sort of issues and, and why are we spending a lot of time working on it? So perhaps a bit of background and context to that. Uh, I lead what we call the local energy systems theme inside CSIRO and basically uh, anything that's to do with energy close to where you guys use it, so close to your houses or your work or where you go shopping, and that could be renewable uh, energy, solar cells on the roof of your house, or energy efficiency, uh, things that might help you manage your demand at home or at your work, is what we do. Uh, and we are a team of about 80 people inside CSIRO working on these sorts of technologies, which is a major part of CSIRO's energy work. Why? Why do we think it's an important issue? So I'm, a, I'm an engineer and, and I work in a science organisation, so you'll have to forgive me, I'm going to have to show you a couple of graphs. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of in my, in my upbringing. Um, this graph here is some energy data from a partic one particular house that we had put some instruments in that uh, measured how people are using electricity and energy in that house over one day. Uh, the graph is reasonably self-explanatory, where you can see that throughout the day, uh, mainly the energy consumption, that pink coloured line was general people's appliances. But as we got later in the day, uh, you'll see that these, those pink coloured triangles, where people were turning on the oven, they got home from work and loads started to increase. Similarly, they turned the lights on. But you might notice that there's a really big triangle happening there across the middle of the day, and that was because it was a stinking hot day in January and that particular house had the air conditioner cranking all day. Uh, and the, uh, we used, the term that we used for that is we call that our peak consumption. And, uh, and that peak consumption is, is a growing problem for Australia's electricity networks and indeed for all of us as consumers. Why is it a problem? Well, it's a problem because those peak consumption, when we have that total amount of electricity consumed, only happens perhaps three, four, five days of the year. So three, four, five days of the year, we have everyone with their air conditioners on and we have to size our electricity poles and wires to provide you and I with electricity for those three or four, five days of the year. The rest of the year, those poles and wires are not being fully utilised. In fact, they're barely being, they're not even close to being fully utilised. So in places like South Australia, you guys might know that the peak consumption in here can be close to double what the normal consumption is every other day of the year. So think about that again. That means four days of the year, perhaps, your electricity consumption doubles and we have to size the poles and wires to carry that electricity, whereas the rest of the year those poles and wires are only being half used. And that's not the most sensible way to, to build our poles and wires and use them. That causes other problems in the electricity network, such as at substations, where I do some work with Australian electricity utilities, that in a particular substation, when they have peak consumption, roughly 40% of the energy flowing through that substation is just wasted as heat because of the way the equipment is using and how hard it has to run. So 40% of the energy there is completely wasted. Again, that's possibly not the smartest thing to do if I sit there and think about it. But at the moment we don't have much choice because of the way people are using their air conditioners and because this peak is growing very dramatically across Australia. So this is a, a, another graph of a, a somewhat different situation. This is a, a graph of someone's solar system in a particular house in Newcastle. And you can see uh, on, the, on the left of the graph, that's about midnight or early in the morning, sorry, and the sun starts to come up and the amount of electricity coming out of that solar system comes up and roughly in the middle of the day it peaks and then the sun starts to go down and the amount of electricity that they're getting out of their home solar system goes down. Now that's a, uh, a, a pretty classical graph that you'd see in any textbook about solar systems and how they work. Unfortunately, it's not a particularly uh, common graph to see. This picture is something that we see much more often. Uh, what do you think is happening here? Clouds, right. So it's again, it's actually a sunny day. So it's a blue sky day but there's clouds in the sky. So we can see early in the morning the sun came up and the solar system gave us a nice clean amount of energy 
But then roughly about 10 o'clock in the morning, some clouds started to travel over and, and the electricity out of that solar system went up and down very, very quickly. Now that's a challenge for how we run our electricity networks because one, it's difficult to rely on that solar system to provide us with a known amount of electricity. And two, those ups and downs, the downs have to be compensated for by something else because when the electricity out of that thing goes down, your fridge might still be on and has to consume electricity from somewhere else. So those very sudden changes are a bit of a, uh, a, a, bit of a challenge for us. And so we have these real peak problems in our electricity network. So we have sudden changes or short-term amounts of electricity that are very high being consumed by air conditioning in particular. And then as we're putting more and more renewable energy, particularly solar, into our electricity networks, we have an even greater intermittency challenge where it's going up and down very quickly. And you could almost consider that a bit of a perfect storm. We've got very peaky loads and quite peaky electricity generators getting installed. So my team do a whole bunch of work on trying to address these sorts of challenges. And we, uh, the, the general term given to that work is we call it demand side management. We're trying to work on technologies to smooth out these peaks and keep up the reliability of our electricity networks. But most importantly, we want to be able to introduce really large amounts of uh, renewable energy generation into our networks whilst keeping the lights on and keeping things reliable. And we want to be able to maximise how we use those poles and wires rather than just build them and only use them three or four days of the year to their full capacity. So I thought I'd talk about a few different technologies that we in CSIRO were working on and then in our discussion we can talk a bit more generally about other things that are happening out there. So one of the projects we have at the moment is called the Virtual Power Station. And this is designed to addre directly address that intermittency challenge that you saw where I showed a graph from one particular house's solar installation. The idea of the virtual power station is to try and combine all of those individual houses into one reliable, and we say dispatchable, quantity of energy. So all of those individual sites look like one big reliable electricity generator that the guys who run our electricity networks know how to deal with. So they know how much electricity they're going to get at some time in the day from all those solar sites, and they can plan and operate the network based on that. So how do we do that? Well, basically, we add a tiny little computer to each individual house's solar installation. And this map is showing you eight houses of our staff where we prototyped this system. Those computers learn how the solar system is responding throughout the day, and provide predictions of what one particular house might be able to give you at, say, 2 o'clock in the, the afternoon. Then, when you combine all of those predictions, you get a prediction of what you think you're going to be able to get across the whole system at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And you actually start taking uh, advantage of what we call geographical diversity, where if there's some clouds headed on my picture up here from the left to the right, then the house at Edgeworth can actually say to someone, oh, it looks like a cloud's just hit me, which I couldn't predict for. My, my solar output went down and warned somebody downstream in Newcastle to say, hey, there's clouds headed your way. You can do something proactive. And that something proactive might be to store some electricity and energy storage for when the output suddenly drops, or it might be to turn some loads off in the house so that the end result is still a smoothing. One of the interesting things we found with this technology was in addition, so we spent a lot of time working on how do we have a really accurate prediction of power output from those solar cells, really scientific type stuff. One of the interesting things we found was people just enjoyed being able to know what their solar system is doing. So this map is actually a web page that we run. And we've now got this in about 30 sites where the homeowners and business owners can double click on their site and see how they're contributing to this greater thing called the virtual power station. They actually feel part of a greater good. They feel belonging to something that's, uh, that's not just their house's solar. And it has some really interesting consequences. They can look and see, well, why is my house only putting out this much electricity, whereas the one down the road, they're exporting even more. And you end up with all sorts of interesting social uh, phenomena when you start doing these sorts of websites. Uh, Related to that sort of work is what we call residential energy management. 
And this is basically where you're trying to um, manage electricity loads in people's houses, such as hot water systems, refrigerators, air conditioners, to be able to compensate for those large spikes. So perhaps we make it so everyone's air conditioner doesn't turn on at the same time, or to, uh, to compensate for when sudden drops in solar energy output occur by being able to manage people's loads. So again, what's happening, and this is happening around the world, is where people are looking at putting little tiny computers in certain appliances, or perhaps one for your whole house that will look after how your fridge runs, how your air conditioner runs, how your hot water service runs, and the pool pump if you've got a pool. You and I won't notice any difference. We'll come home, and the idea is that our house should be comfortable. It's nice inside, the beer's cold, the shower's hot, the pool's clean. So our lifestyle isn't affected at all, but we're being able to manage those loads, stop all the air conditioners turning on at the same time, or allow us to have lots of renewable energy whilst still keeping the electricity grid reliable. We do a bunch of work related to that also in commercial buildings. So uh, this is a technology that uh, we developed for controlling large air conditioning systems, what we call heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, in big office buildings. This particular technology basically plugs into a computer that already controls most large office buildings. And really, we say it just adds some brains to that computer. It thinks about what's the weather going to do. It thinks about what's the price of electricity doing at the moment. And it thinks about something with human comfort. So rather than controlling the building to be 22 degrees Celsius all day, we control the building to keep people comfortable. And comfort is not actually directly related to temperature. If it's 40 degrees outside, you might be quite comfortable if it's 25 inside rather than it being 22. So we consider those sorts of things. There's lots of science in what we call human comfort models to run the building to keep people comfortable. How much energy did that save? 30%. So in a standard office building, uh, we installed this system and saved about 30% of the e energy that went into heating and cooling that particular building by basically thinking about human comfort and better times to run the air conditioning system. That's a significant change. Okay, so hopefully you, uh, you can recall my graph of, the, uh, of a house and, and how electricity consumption was changing over time. What I've added to that graph is the blue triangle at the back. And the blue triangle is showing you the electricity consumption from a real house where they had an electric car. So now we're talking a little bit further out into the future and this particular house had an electric car that they could plug in. So they drove uh, to and from work, which was a 50 kilometre distance, came home and plugged their car into the house to recharge overnight. There was no control over that car and how it charged. And you can see we've made the whole peak situation even worse. Not only did we have the air conditioning consumed by, uh, the, sorry, the energy consumed by the air conditioner in the house, now we're consuming a large amount of energy in recharging the vehicle ready to go to work the next day. That's a real worry for electricity networks if we're going to realise this, uh, this scenario of lots of people having plug-in electric vehicles because we're adding even greater peak load to our electricity networks. So there's a way you can deal with that, and it's basically to control when that car's going to be charged. So by having a communications to the house and controlling when you start charging the battery in the car, you can do it early in the morning, as I've shown here at midnight. That way we're shifting that peak away from when everyone had their air conditioner on, and we don't need to build the poles and wires to deal with the car, plus the air conditioner, plus the oven, plus the hot plate, plus the hot water system all happening at the same time. So that sort of work is, is a pretty much state of the art at the moment, but where, do we, where are we and many other people around the world interested is the next situation where we actually use the car to power the air conditioner in your house. So when we have a peak demand problem on the electricity network, we actually start discharging the battery inside the car to run your air conditioner for that very short instant of time that we need to run that air conditioner when everyone else's is on. If you think about it, your car, an electric vehicle, is really just a battery with some wheels attached. I would argue, so long as you are confident you can get to work tomorrow, you really don't mind what happens to the battery in that car, particularly if someone will compensate you to be able to use that battery to supply air conditioning in your suburb across a number of cars. 
So uh, CSIRO and others are really interested in this idea and we're doing a bunch of research now to see how are people using cars and is this just marketing or can they actually be used to provide assistance to our electricity grids to try and solve some of these peak challenges that we have without having to build more poles and wires. Lastly, I uh, wanted to I put a slide here about alternative energy storage technologies. So hopefully um, later tonight we'll have a presentation about energy storage and what's happening in that around Australia. Lots of people are doing lots of work with batteries and other ways of storing energy. Um, something that we're looking at, and CSIRO does a lot of work in battery storage as well, but batteries are ex relatively expensive, they wear out, and there's uh, interesting chemicals involved and all sorts of other challenges around energy storage. So we're looking at also looking at ways of how can we store energy <coughs> without needing a battery. And uh, the photo here is showing you uh, an example of where we have a little control system on a fridge and that's linked to a large wind farm that's nearby our laboratories. And if we know that the uh, output of the wind farm is about to drop, then we might be able to run those fridges in a really smart way to deal with that. So what do we do? We can predict that the output from the wind farm is dropping and before that happens, we actually make the fridge slightly colder than it needs to be. Then when the output of the wind farm suddenly drops, we turn the fridge off and when the output comes back up a few seconds or maybe even just a few minutes later, we turn the fridge back on. We're only talking really short periods of time here that we need to be able to manage those loads to deal with that up and down in electricity supply. Now it's arguable whether we'll ever do that to the fridges in your and my house, but if, you're if you think about the fridges in a large supermarket or a large food storage area, or even the office buildings around here where if we turn the air conditioner off just for a few minutes, you're actually storing heat and cold in the building and no one really notices, you can have a significant, bring significant advantage to the electricity networks without needing large battery technologies. So that's an example of some, uh, some other work that we're looking into to try and deal with this peak, intermittent, uh, peak and intermittency issues. So I guess in, in closing, what's the future looking like? Well, I gave some examples of, of technologies that we're looking at. These technologies could be taken up by a large number of, of, of different business models and different types of people. It could be your elec local electricity utility uh, installs this in your house and offers you a, a rebate on your bill to do that. It could be a new energy services company comes along and says, we'll pay you $100 a month to allow us to control your car and your air conditioner and your hot water and we promise you'll be comfortable and you'll get to work but we'll give you this check in the mail if you let us do that and then they sell that capacity back to somebody else who's benefiting it in the network. Um, I think importantly and something we all need to keep in mind when we're looking at these technologies and, and you should think about if someone's offering you uh, the, a proposition such as I just mentioned, we need to be really comfortable that this is not warm beer, cold shower sort of stuff. If we get some of these technologies wrong, as we've seen elsewhere in the world, then people are have their air conditioners are going off on stinking hot days and people get a little bit upset when that happens then we suddenly lose all the advantages that are possible here. So we need to be really careful to have intelligent management technologies that can ensure you and I are comfortable and happy. It doesn't mean that we have to dramatically change our lifestyles. Lastly, I think we, uh, as an industry as a whole, need to look at these sorts of demand side issues and, and try and ensure that the benefits that we're really giving people in electricity networks and others are being passed through to you and I. I know I'm not going to be overly comfortable in allowing someone to control my electric vehicle unless I'm seeing some particular benefit and that's one of the human nature challenges that we face in these sorts of technologies. That's it, so uh, happy to take some questions and have a chat. A lot of key issues to cover. Maybe I'll start with that idea of uh, of using your electric vehicles as a as a sort of grid wired battery. Mm. There's a, a program called Better Place and and a demonstration that's going on in, in Canberra. I think it's the case. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because it is it is a reality that people are trying this idea out now. It's not just hypothetical, is it? 
Yeah, that's right. So, so Better Place are, a, uh, I guess, a fairly entrepreneurial sort of company that are looking at how can electric vehicles... Um, uh, their business model includes not just the vehicle itself, but also selling that capacity to allow the vehicle to benefit electricity grids and so on, and they will earn income from that. You'll be able to get to work. Better Place will, uh, will use that vehicle and resell that capacity to electricity network companies. Um, and th their business model really is, is predicated partly on these sort of novel approaches. So they're not just a car company anymore, they're suddenly providing all sorts of other services using that battery that's stuck in the car. And that includes battery swapping? Yeah, so that's right. They, uh, um, their particular in uh, the technology is based on being able to remove the whole battery out of the vehicle. And uh, so when you pull into a petrol station, you basically swap the battery out rather than try and recharge it and those sorts of things. So. Has anywhere in the world done this on a large scale or is this pretty new? Uh, oh, it's, it's most definitely new. Um, so as far as being able to control cars or loads, uh, I guess a couple of, of anecdotes of where it's happening. Um, in the United States at the moment, there's a, a couple of companies running around where they're building, uh, putting batteries literally on the back of a semi-trailer. Uh, and so it's a semi-trailer sized battery and plugging that battery into the electricity network and making money by selling the capacity from that battery to the electricity network companies. Now that's a semi-trailer sized battery. The only reason they really need that is because there's not enough electric cars out there plugged into the network that they could control. But it doesn't take much of a stretch to think that you can divide that semi-trailer up into 10, 20, 30 electric cars and achieve the same result. Uh, there's also, uh, if we consider electricity loads, uh, there's also a company in England at the moment who are going to people owning cool rooms and putting a very simple technology on, uh, on these cool rooms that basically watches the frequency of the electricity system. And the frequency of the electricity system uh, is a really good health indicator, if you like, of how the electricity system is operating. So if the frequency starts to go down, it probably means we've got a bit of a problem somewhere, a shortage of electricity generation. So normally what happens is back in the power station, if the electricity starts to go down, they turn up the accelerator and, and the generator speeds up and compensates for the frequency going down. Instead of doing that, what these guys are doing is putting a little box on cool rooms that just watches the frequency. And when the frequency starts to go down, it turns the cool room off for a little while. They're selling that capacity onto the same electricity market that large electricity generators are participating on. Not only are they selling that capacity on the electricity market, they're now also tra trading carbon from that because it's, uh, if you don't need to turn on a big p uh, coal or gas-fired generator or accelerate it to deal with that frequency dropping, then you're reducing the amount of CO2 emissions um, and so you can sell that carbon reduction on other markets. So yeah, there's a few examples of these sorts of things happening, but it's, it's most definitely bleeding edge, let's say. And that frequency monitoring is the kind of technology you're envisaging for the smart meters to turn on and off your pool pumps and your fridge compressor and, and things like that. Is that the way they do it? Communicate to the substation via the frequency? Uh, no. <laughs> so we, um, our particular approach is a, a bit more of, I, I guess you would say, a little bit more sophisticated or rich communications channels. So one way is just to look at frequency, but you can only compensate for small things by just monitoring frequency. It's, it's, it's very uh, easy and simple and cheap. You don't need communications out to the house or out to the cool room. We're taking a different approach where we assume you do have communications out to the house or out to the cool room. And if you have those communications, you can do different things such as Rather than just turn the compressor off, you can say, how about we make it a few degrees colder so that if I turn the compressor off, I guarantee that the room will stay within certain temperature boundaries. So we, uh, we're relying on, on having more communications. And yes, uh, the communications that come with smart meters are one of those communication paths that you could use. So Victoria, unique amongst the states right now, is rolling out some implementation of sort of semi-smart meters. Uh, what will their abilities be and why are they taking the plunge? You know, it's always this uh, 
this problem a bit like when you're buying a computer. Do you wait for the next super duper model or do you deploy yeah. it at some point? And why has Victoria taken this decision to, to do this on a large scale? Um, I, so that's a good question. I guess if I may be a little bit of background to, to smart meters in general. Um, smart meters is a, a, a term used to describe a whole bunch of different things. At its simplest, it's a, a term used to describe a system that instead of needing a person to go out to your electricity meter, it has an auto, uh, it's automated. So your electricity meter communicates back to your utility and says how much energy your house just used. At its simplest, that's what a smart meter does. Um, most smart meters now also measure not only how much, house, how much electricity your house used over the past three months, they also measure when you used that electricity. And so they communicate when you used that electricity back to the electricity company. And that's allowing electricity companies to introduce different types of electricity tariffs, where those tariffs, the amount you pay for electricity will depend on what time it is in the day. So it's a little bit similar to you might see this on some toll roads at the moment, where if it's a peak time, you pay more to consume that electricity. And the idea here is that it's, uh, the electricity companies are hoping that will incentivise you to reduce your energy consumption during those peak times by making the price really high. But it wouldn't be fair to say that a smart meter has to have that sort of electricity tariff. It certainly doesn't. Um, it's most, most specifically designed to, to automatically communicate energy consumption from your house quite quickly back to some central point. So our interest is really about uh, what can you do with that electricity consumption information. And I know when I get my electricity bill, and I'm a fairly energy conscious sort of guy, I get it every uh, four times a year and I look at my bill and I go, oh, damn, you know, how did I do that? And it's very difficult. There's no instantaneous feedback on how am I using electricity. Uh, so I'm certainly an advocate of being able to know more about how we're using our electricity. I think the discussion around uh, what we call time of use tariffs is, a, is an interesting one and really a political question. Why are the Victorians pushing ahead here? Well, uh, let's say I hope it's for some of the benefits such as if we inform people how they're using energy much more accurately, then you and I will be able to make smart decisions and we might be able to go outside and turn that fridge off in the shed because suddenly we know how much electricity is the fridge in the shed is using, and more importantly, how much that thing's costing us. So following on from that idea, the, the electricity pricing system is very socialised right now. You know, everyone compensates a few people for, for the peaks and so on. Is there a, a risk if we go too far the other way that we'll overly liberalise it so that people who could least afford to pay, um, but maybe most vulnerable, such as old folks, we're watching their energy meter and, and seeing the price rocket up and, and suffering through the heat, essentially dying or, or suffering from it, whereas Mr Moneybags, I don't, I don't care, and just um, continues to run his air conditioning full blast. How do we, I know it's a big sort of question, but how do we start to approach that sort of problem? Because I can see politically it's going to create a real storm. Sure. So you're right, it has, and it has created such a storm. So there's a, I'd agree with you, there's a great deal of concern here about if we're going to expose people to these time varying prices, uh, what's that mean to you and I? And, and let me paint, a, I guess, a worst case scenario. Uh, some people would uh, think that the prices you and I pay will become even more volatile. So on the electricity market where electricity is bought and sold, so generators sell it and retailers, the people who uh, sell you electricity, they buy it off the generators. The price there is amazingly volatile. It can go from $70 to $10,000 in the space of a few minutes, literally. Some people would like to expose you and I to that sort of variability because if the retailer is paying $10,000 and you and I aren't, then they're obviously hemorrhaging money and there's a real problem for them. So. Uh, However, there's genuine social concerns there. Um, I think the, the best way to deal with that, and certainly the way, you know, it's, it's most definitely a political question, uh, but the way we are dealing with it through our work is in these energy management systems. So if we're smart about having some automated way of dealing with uh, those time varying prices, then you could, uh, in anyone's house, have a very cheap computer sitting possibly in the electricity meter that sees the price is about to go through the roof 
and manages your air conditioner for you so that you don't have to pay a huge amount of money for that. So it keeps, you know, um, in my case, my grandmother, uh, you know, I walk into her house uh, in winter and it's 30 degrees inside and she has an electric electricity powered air conditioner and it costs an absolute fortune, but I dare not turn the thing down. Um, so if that my grandmother could have something managing her energy consumption, um, then we could hopefully keep her comfortable but do it in those times when the electricity price is much cheaper. So I certainly believe there's an opportunity there for technology to help out with some of that social problem. Do you think um, there'd be scope for techie people to be able to program their own systems as well and say have an algorithm and monitor price and those that they decide what their scenarios are? Uh, I'd, so we, I would certainly say that um, we think people should have the uh, ability to provide input and provide preferences, but not require it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my grandmother's case, I certainly don't want her to have to have any involvement in that energy management thing. Um, she's obviously, she's not a particularly technical savvy person, but if, uh, in my case, I'm probably, or many of my staff, we'd enjoy messing around mm -hmm. with that box and... Uh, trying to optimise how it's trading off for comfort versus, uh, versus price and those sorts of things. That's right, yep. Exactly. So we, uh, a number of utilities around Australia are doing that mm -hmm. and we would consider that the first generation of these sorts of demand response technologies. So I know we haven't talked about energy efficiency at all yet, but... Uh, of uh, those demand response technologies are really uh, what we call direct load control, where someone in a control room sees there's likely to be a problem, hits a big red button and turns off compressors in air conditioners, for example. Um, the challenge they have is they're unsure whether you're comfortable at the moment or not, uh, to be honest. Uh, you know, they, they hope you will be and there's a, there's a hope that your house has enough thermal mass to, to maintain your comfort. We're certainly um, uh, pro uh, enthusiastic about those technologies, but I think if they're to realise mass uh, adoption across all of the uh, you know, across everyone's house, then we need to get a little bit more sophisticated in making sure people are comfortable and the technologies are really uh, meshing well with how we run our lives.